so thankful to be back into the truth of the word after a week of studying and looking at false religion and seeing how scripture is twisted and distorted to man's thinking rather than God's truth. So thankful to be back in the word today. And because it feels like a month, it's only been you know, two weeks. I think it's important to recap where we are in Jesus's earthly ministry. If you recall, Jesus encountered a man who was born blind and he gave him sight. The Pharisees heard about this and they called him in and said, hey, how'd this happen? He said, well, this man gave me sight. And who is the man? Oh, I don't know. And just went off. But then he found out that it was Jesus. And he went back to the Pharisees and told them what the deal was. And they didn't like the answer. So he got a little feisty with them and they booted him out of the synagogue. When Jesus heard that this man had been cast out from the synagogue, he went after him, after this man who now has his sight. And he gave him the opportunity to believe in the Son of Man. And he did. And in this conversation that Jesus had with this man, the Pharisees were within earshot. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on here? Are we blind also? And they weaseled their way into the conversation. And Jesus had some not so nice things to say about them. And so what we're going to look at this morning is a continuation of that conversation that Jesus is having with the man who now has sight and the Pharisees. And I'm sure by now there's some other onlookers that are now drawn closer because wherever Jesus was, he was drawing people. Pick up right where we left off, which will be the Gospel of John, chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, and again, I want to point out, as we've done in the past, every time we see the phrase truly, truly, we know that Jesus is about to share a profound truth that may be difficult for the hearer to receive and comprehend. So we're just going to be on guard for that. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. I think it might be helpful to get an understanding of what a sheepfold is. Depending on how wealthy the owner of the flock was, it can have a different implementation. But generally speaking, it was a covered pen that was open on one side and closed on the three other sides with a roof. And there was like a little gathering area in front of the opening where the sheep would congregate. And there would be a stone wall that encompassed the whole thing capped with thorns. Biblical barbed wire. That was the idea, was to prevent people from climbing over. So there was thorns on top of this stone wall that surrounded that little pen, or big pen, and a single doorway. That's what a sheepfold is. Let's continue on. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Here's an interesting thing about shepherds and their sheep. It's still true today. Shepherds give their sheep, each and every one of them, a unique name. And he has a certain call. He uses a certain sound to call his flock, an assembly call. And there are times when shepherds from different flocks would take their sheep out into this large field And the flocks would intermingle because, you know, just kind of wandering, roaming, eating grass and all that. The shepherds might be catching up on the latest news and they didn't have Facebook back then. So that's how they caught up on current events. When it was time to gather the sheep, the shepherds would separate to various portions of this outer field and they would call their sounding call for their flock. And what would happen is the sheep from one flock, even though they're intermixed, they would turn their heads towards the shepherd and he'd call again and they would extricate themselves from this mass of of sheep and follow the shepherd as the other shepherds doing the same thing. And so the sheep knew the voices of their shepherd and followed. It must have been quite a scene to see all the sheep just suddenly like just dispersed to different directions. But that's what Jesus is referring to when he's sharing this symbolism. Verse 6, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. I think it's important to point out, Scripture points out clearly that this is a figure of speech. We know that there are some who believe that you have to allegorize and spiritualize the entire Bible to understand it, but we here believe in a literal interpretation of Scripture the literal, grammatical, historical view of Scripture. The fact that Scripture says, well, what you just read is a figure of speech means that if it doesn't say that, it's not supposed to be taken as a figure of speech. It should be taken literally. So this is a proof text that uh, the literal interpretation of Scripture is the proper one. And to literally interpret figures of speech as figures of speech. 
Verse 7, so Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, there it is, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Also in these verses, I would encourage you to underline, I am the door in verse 9, and I am the door in verse 7. These are, again, wonderful verses that describe the exclusivity of Christ in entering the kingdom. There is no other way to enter into the kingdom of God but through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says it right there. He didn't say, I'm one of many doors. It's not this big garage door open. And anybody can just you know, anywhere, anytime go in. No, it's him and him alone. He is the door. There is one door into the kingdom, and that's Jesus. So for those who claim there are many roads to the same God, you can bring them to Scripture, those verses. This is very effective. Ask them to read those verses out loud. Ask them to do that. And then ask them, well, what does that say to you? And watch the Holy Spirit work. I've seen this happen. It's amazing. The Spirit does the convincing. The Spirit does the convicting. And they can't argue with you because you haven't said anything other than, what does it say? The exclusivity of Christ is right there. In these 10 short verses, we see two things that we'll be looking at over the next few minutes. First is the authenticity of the shepherd. Jesus describes what an authentic shepherd looks like. What are the qualifications of an authentic shepherd of the flock? And conversely, or on the other side of the equation, we see attributes of the sheep. What does a sheep of the flock look like? There are some characteristics and attributes of a sheep of the flock. We're going to look at those two things because not only obviously do these verses describe himself and his relationship to the kingdom and to those other believers who would follow him, but by extension, he lays out this model for how modern day shepherds should comport themselves, should be behaving. Jesus continuously in his earthly ministry modeled the way as we, all of us, should follow him. So we're going to be looking at that as well. There are seven elements of what it means to be a true shepherd. Seven marks of a true shepherd. The first one in your notes, the true shepherd enters the sheepfold by the door or the recognized way or entrance. Enters the sheepfold by the door. Not climbing over the wall, not tunneling under the wall, but through the door. John 4, 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus always does the will of the Father. Always. He is God. He could certainly do his thing as he sees fit, but he constantly, continuously submitted himself, subjected himself to the authority of the Father. And he told everyone around him, I am doing my Father's will. It's not my will, but my Father's will. He's modeling the way of submissiveness to the Father. In the same way, pastors, elders, leaders should be doing as Scripture commands for how the church is structured, conducted, and cared for. Thieves and robbers enter another way. The modern application of that is pragmatism. Ends justify the means. Whatever it takes to get that end point, do. That's the modern day pragmatism of many of today's churches. But Jesus says, no, you enter through the door. If this is the Lord's church, you do it the Lord's way. He has a very specific set of requirements for leaders. And we see that in First and Second Timothy and in Titus and elsewhere, who is qualified to lead God's flock and what their roles and responsibilities are. Can't just do what you feel like because it makes sense to you. If it's the Lord's church, it's done the Lord's way. Pragmatism has no place in the kingdom. It claims that man's way is better than the Lord's way. And some examples of that, if we see these young guys who are pastors dressing like hipsters and acting real cool, nothing wrong with how they dress. There's nothing sinful in that, but there's an edge to them. There's a worldliness about them in how they present themselves before the congregation that they think is helpful in forwarding the gospel because, hey, look, isn't the pastor cool? He's talking about the latest Star Wars movie in the middle of his sermon. And there are many pastors who do that who use cultural references within as the focus of their messages because they think it's relevant, it's going to connect with unbelievers, and yet does nothing for the believers, for the flock. That pragmatism, sharing their review of Star Wars, has anything to do with preach the word. My role and responsibility comes down to, and Jesus said this to Peter, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Those three things. Nowhere in there does it say, be culturally relevant to try to draw in people who are rejecting Christ. Preach the word. That kind of pragmatism to get butts in the seats is not 
what the church is about. That's not how the Lord has set up his flock. It's for believers to grow and develop disciples. The second mark of a true shepherd has the door open for him by the gatekeeper because he is recognized by the gatekeeper. He doesn't have to weasel his way in. The door is open because he's recognized. For Jesus, God the Holy Spirit empowered him. It was the Holy Spirit who empowered his ministry. And he said that. For pastors, elders, for leaders today, it's the Lord who grants permission, protection, and provision. As we see just in our short time here at Grace, in two plus years, it's the Lord. It's the Lord working and moving, holding back, pushing forward in his timing. How many folks have we invited to just sit in on a Bible study? How many? And don't even show up, ever. If everyone who has told me personally, you know what, I've been meaning to check you out. I'm going to show up this Sunday. If everyone had done that, we would have launched and probably look at planting another church out of grace. I mean, that's how many people have said that. But the Lord in his sovereignty has moved us and grown us methodically according to his plan. And I submit all of us to his plan. Not going to push, not going to rush, not going to have a little truck going up and down the streets in the neighborhoods with a big bullhorn saying, hey, come to our church. The Lord has not called us to do that. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not our calling. So it's the Lord who provides, protects, and grants permission. Every ministry is different. Same God, same word, if they're teaching the word. Number three, the third mark of a true shepherd is he calls his own sheep, not other sheep. John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Jesus called those who are his, not those who aren't. He called everyone to repentance, but he knew there were some that would not respond. But he didn't grab them and drag them kicking and screaming into the kingdom. He didn't do that. Earlier in my walk, I felt like maybe I needed to do that, that the Lord needed a little help in getting somebody into the kingdom, a little bit more forceful, a little strong in the debate and conversation to try to get them and wrestle them into the kingdom. And I realized, well, no, it's the Holy Spirit who does the convincing and the convicting. No one has ever been saved by beating them over the head with scripture and just dragging them into the kingdom and wearing them down. Don't wear anybody down. The Holy Spirit will wear them down in their constant rebellion against them. He will wear them down, but we don't have to wear them down till they say, all right, already, I'll, I'll believe. Just get off my back. If that ever happened, that person is not saved. At that point, they weren't saved. Maybe they were saved later on, but all right, already, I believe is not the forward profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So he calls his own sheep for pastors and elders today, leaders and fellow believers. The Lord will bring numerous people into our sphere of influence and lives. And the ones that he has convicted to make disciples of within this local body will stay. And in our information meeting, I share a little one minute video clip from Dr. John MacArthur, where he talks about what church is about. And it's not about a numbers game. And he makes that clear. And he ends that little section with, Scripture doesn't say just get a crowd and keep them, whether they're believers or not, but to hit them with the words of Jesus and whoever stays, make disciples of them. That's easy. I don't want to deliberately offend somebody and have them go away. I will speak the truth, teach the truth, and encourage them to receive the truth. And we've seen this in our fellowship where people don't want to hear the truth. They flat out have said, I reject that truth and have left. I pray for them. I'm not going to chase them. No, come back. You don't. No, no they're not ready. The fourth mark of a true shepherd calls his sheep by name. A personal relationship calls a sheep by name. First Peter 5, 7. Love this verse. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. How many times have we not gone to the Lord in prayer in our time of need? He cares for us. He loves us. He is concerned for us even though he knows the circumstances because he has allowed those circumstances in our life. But he cares for us and he wants us to seek him first. And this is one of those burdens for me. And I've shared this in the past at other churches that I had roles of leadership responsibility. And from the pulpit on a Sunday, I had exclaimed how burdened my heart was that I was spiritually responsible for people in the congregation and I didn't even know their names. At that time, I ran into someone at Costco, and you run into all sorts of people at Costco. And a person came up to me and thanked me for the teaching last week or you know, the week before or whatever. And I'm like, whoa, you go to so-and-so church? I said, yeah, well, how long have you been attending? A year. And it was like a knife through the heart. He was a person who had been attending this church for at least a year. 
And I had no clue this person attended. And the Spirit just grabbed a hold of my heart. This is not a condemnation or conviction on anyone else. It's a personal conviction towards me. I feel that I need to know everyone by name and circumstance that I'm spiritually responsible for. Because I'm going to stand before the Lord at the end of time and be held accountable for what I did with God's people. The Lord's going to look at me and say, Tom, what did you do with Jimmy? Who's Jimmy? (laughs) Well, he sat in your church for 20 years. What did you do to care for him? What do I say to that? What do I say to the Lord when he says that? That's terrifying to me. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be that intimate relationship. And oftentimes, the size of a church is given and a reason for not having that close relationship and fellowship with those under their care. I don't ever want to be in that position again, ever, because it's not how the Lord's designed it. He's called us to be in fellowship together, to be a family. And I do. I'm so thankful that I know I know you all and getting to know your circumstances even more over time. And it's wonderful because when I pray for you, I know what to pray for. And as I mentioned at the information meeting, I had a certain number that was going to kind of be the ultimate cap of how large we would ever be. We're nowhere near that. But it was based on how many names can I and faces can I remember personally, my personal capacity, which meant over time as I get older, the number is going to shrink because my memory is not going to be so good. You know, so from 10 years from now, when I can only remember five people, that's it. I was convicted that that number has to be much, much lower than even that small number. Because not only do I want to know every name and face and circumstance of the person who's part of our fellowship, but of their family members as well. When we pray for somebody, I want to know about your sister. I want to know about the brother who's not a believer. And so all of a sudden that shrinks down by an order of magnitude, how big we can get and still have that unity and relationship. It's important. Some of these churches do a very good job. They'll divvy up the flock to elders as under shepherds, and that's helpful. But at the same time, as the teaching pastor, the shepherd of God's word and flock, it's important that he too also know everybody. It's not, if you have to divide it up like that, just form four or five different churches. What's wrong with that? So enough of that. That's just a hot button for me. I know it really is a burden on my heart. Um, Number five, the fifth mark of a true shepherd leads the sheep out to new pastors and doesn't force them out. Jesus is clear. He leads them out. He draws his people. You may not realize that he draws us to new pastures, but he does draw us to new pastures using the circumstances in our lives. How many times have we just been rocking with the Lord? Everything's going well. Lord, I'm just doing things that please you. And, and all of a sudden, this curveball comes from left field and rocks our world. Well, how'd that happen? That shouldn't have happened. You know, Lord, I'm following with you. I'm okay. So why'd you do that? That's the way he draws us to now respond to this circumstance because he wants to move us. He can use our health. He can use our finances. He can use relationships. He uses those things. He allows or authors them to draw us into a new pasture because we tend to just be sedentary beings. We get cozy. We like where we're at. And that's how it's going to be. Eva loves to decorate our home. And you've seen she does a wonderful job. And she likes to move furniture around. (laughs) And I love that, that she has the freedom to do that. For me, if the furniture stays put for 40 years, I'm okay. I'm not. I'm okay. She wants to change it every day. She doesn't do that. But if she changed it every day, okay, I'd be okay with that too. But we all have those proclivities one way or the other. And so the Lord will use those circumstances in our lives to draw us. And then we can go kicking and screaming or we can seek him and say, all right, Lord, what are you trying to do for me and through me in this situation? That's when we're on his program and he doesn't need to use a divine two by four upside our head and say, no, you got to go there because it's for your good. So... (laughs) Yeah, I'm seeing some nods, so yeah. (laughs) For us today, though, it's about laying the groundwork and showing our work. If the Lord's going to move us on to a new season of ministry, another level, a different level, whatever that may be, the Lord will guide us methodically through it, and we'll see the work, we'll see the dots being laid out and connected, and we won't rush things, but we will do it in His timing, and it'll be Certain. Yeah, that was the Lord. Absolutely the Lord doing that because he'll control the timing. He may have a specific time when something has to happen and he's going to make sure that it doesn't until that time. And so any effort on our part to do something or not do something will be thwarted because he has that specific time that he has. Number six, 
true shepherd brings all of the sheep out and leaves none behind. John 18, 9, this was to fulfill the word that he has spoken of those whom he gave me, I have lost not one. Jesus draws all, all that are in his flock, he's going to move them all. Regardless of what local body of believers they're in, he's moving them exactly where he wants them. He leaves none of the true believers behind in their growth and sanctification, in his divine plan for humanity and creation. He doesn't leave any believer behind. And that's the responsibility of today's pastors, elders, and and leaders as well. Even when we don't have a formal position of leadership, we do have influence on brothers and sisters in Christ. We do have that uh, reputation and influence. So in that regard, we have to be equally aware. So I guess maybe I should have prefaced this section by saying, even if we're not formally elders or pastors or ministry leaders, we still have the responsibility of being true to what God's Word says. And this kind of transcends those formal roles. Whenever we have an opportunity to influence somebody, we should do so in a similar manner. For all of us, we should not show partiality. Let's just lead the easy sheep, the sheep that we like. Let's lead them out. We studied in the book of James how that's an abomination before the Lord, that partiality. Jesus wants all the sheep led, and that means all. There's no justification for leaving high-maintenance sheep behind. (laughs) I characterize them as high-maintenance because, you know, that's, unfortunately, that's a lot of the mindset that goes on. Oh, that person is too much trouble. Uh, Let's just give them lip service and kind of pat them on the head. And as long as they don't leave, we've done our job. And that's not what the Lord has called us to do. We all have different rates of growth and maturing. We can't just say, oh, the bulk of us are on this pace, but there's a few who are lagging behind. That's where we come around together and say, encourage one another and say, hey, let's walk together. There's a reason you're part of this flock, but you're not as fast a walker as that person. There's a reason for that. And maybe it's to teach the sprinter patience. And maybe it's to teach the sprinter it's more than just about yourself. So leave none behind. The seventh mark of a true shepherd is gives them life abundantly. Obviously, Jesus gives life. He gives new life, a new heart, new spirit in abundance. And it's giving. It's a gift. Jesus didn't say that he sells life and life abundantly or earn. You have to earn this life. He says he gives, gives life and gives it abundantly. He's not stingy with the life that he gives us. That abundance is not necessarily materialism, though there can be materialistic aspects of it, absolutely, but that's not the abundant life that he's referring to. I can't give life. I have no ability to give life to anybody, but I can point people to the life. I can point people to the living word on how to receive that life, and that's what we should all do, is point people to the life. We can't give them life. Only the Lord Jesus can. Encouragement, sacrificial love and care. And in contrast, 7a, thieves and robbers steal, kill, destroy. They're in it for personal gain. But it's not only the TBN hucksters focusing on that as thieves. It's easy to just look at the most extreme example and say, well, yeah, those are clearly thieves and robbers. Those guys who smack people in the head and wave a jacket around and collect the money. Those are definitely thieves and robbers, but that's not the only definition and description of a thief and robber. There are pastors in many of the churches that seem solid on the outside that are thieves and robbers as well. They steal. They use the church funds or their position for personal gain. Doors of opportunity open for that person that don't open for other people and using that for their own advantage. Destroy. They'll use and abuse servants to further their own agenda. If a servant can do something to further my agenda type thing, then I'm going to use them for that and not for the glory of the Lord. If the Lord's glorified, that's happy coincidence. You know, that's the mindset of a thief and a robber. And also further kill that thief and robber. When they kill, they push out people who aren't loyal to them because they stand in the way of their own agenda. I would highly encourage you to read this week the supporting verses at the top of your teaching outline. That's Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 12 through 16, and 1 Peter 5, 1 through 14. Again, we see the symbolism of the shepherd and the sheep. And that would be a great parallel set of verses to study this week if you are looking for additional study and impact of this teaching. So we've looked at the authenticity of the shepherd. Let's take a look at the attributes of the sheep. 
which is also described in these verses. And the metaphor is often misused. It's almost always misused. This shepherd sheep metaphor is almost always misused. Shepherd and sheep, that symbolism is about the relationship. Okay, it's the relationship between the congregation and those who are responsible for caring for the congregation. It's used to describe the responsibilities of the shepherd, of the pastor, of the elder, of the ministry leader. It's never used to describe the character of the believers. What I mean by that, have you ever heard sheep are dumb? Have you ever heard that? Well, you know, sheep need a shepherd because sheep are dumb. Sheep are stupid. And I heard a long speech, I would say, I won't even call it a sermon, for 20, 30 minutes on how dumb sheep are and connecting that with God's people. Sheep are dumb. That's why they have to be led. And that kind of mindset that happens in church leadership, that absent the presence of the pastor and the elder, these sheep, they just go all over the place. That's not what Jesus is referring to when he talks about the shepherd and the sheep. It's never about the characteristics or the traits of the believer, but defining the roles and responsibilities of the shepherd who is supposed to care for them. Sheep are content. They're clean. They're innocent. They're meek. They're shy and they're useful, but they're not dumb. Matthew 10, 16. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. He certainly wasn't calling his apostles dumb. I'm sending you dummies out. No, sending you out gentle, innocent, meek. This narrative that sheep are dumb. That just puffs up pastors and leaders with pride and justifies to believers why they don't grow in sanctification. This mindset keeps the congregation in a perpetual state of being spiritual infants who don't grow in discernment and don't grow in the more complex truths of God's word. Don't buy that for a moment. Anyone who tells you, well, sheep are dumb and we need a shepherd. No, that's... The Lord has set it up to have the sheep-shepherd relationship, but it has nothing to do with the character or abilities of the sheep. It's insidious and it's harmful. So having said that, let's look at five attributes of a sheep of the flock. One, knows the shepherd's voice. That simply means to have discernment, to know what is of the Lord and what's not. Now, we certainly don't have that perfected yet, but as we walk with the Lord, we grow in discernment. A biblical filter grid of discernment gets finer and finer, and we can see subtleties that we couldn't see before in error and in truth. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we know the shepherd's voice. We know what's true. We know what's false. The second attribute responds to the shepherd's voice. Sheep of the flock of God respond to the shepherd's voice, which is to be moved into action by God's word. We read God's word, we hear God's word being taught, and we have a response. And that response is action. Not just to say, oh, that was a wonderful talk, but to move into action, to change things in our life as a result of what we've heard or read. Obedience, seeking him in prayer and word and fellowship. 2 Corinthians 10.5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Even our thoughts, and especially our thoughts, that's where the battlefield is, in our mind and in our hearts. Responding to the shepherd's voice, even in our hearts. Number three, rejects the voice of the strangers. Kind of the flip side of that, the other half of discernment. Dismisses false teachings and is not drawn to false teachers. But I have to, again, define that a false teacher is not identified by the truthful things they say, but by the false things they say. So often we can see a pastor or preacher and he'll say something that's truthful. And we recognize, yeah, that's truth. And think, oh, he's a good teacher. He's truly teaching the word. But that's not how we define a false teacher. We define them by the false things they say. When we look at a Joel Osteen, he may occasionally open up the word and accurately read scripture and like, well, he's preaching the word but then goes off into this own self-help diatribe of living your best life now, absent any involvement of the Lord. That's what makes him a false teacher, not the fact that he was able to read correctly what's in the Word. Oftentimes, we see and this growing as those who had a faithful track record of service fall away, drift away. The great apostasy is currently underway. We can't just 
rest on a person's track record up to that point or maybe up to five years ago and think, well, you know, so-and-so, their teachings, their books were always spot on. And so I'm going to read this book and continue to recommend this person based on past. Really, we have to be good Bereans on that and constantly assessing and reviewing. And so we have to look at what the false things they say, because false teachers will use the hook of truth to draw people in. You'll see some picture reposted that has a little catchy saying that sounds Bible-y. That seems true. And well, I recognize the name, and that name seems to be pretty reliable. So, yeah, I'm going to go with that. And it's not. We have to reject the voices of the strangers. Along with that, number four, flees from the stranger. Flees from the stranger. Not only do we reject the voice of the stranger, we don't hang around them. So I'm rejecting what you're saying, but you know what? I like the people you're drawing, so I'm going to hang around with you as well. Flee the stranger, 1 Timothy 6.11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. True sheep of the flock of God remove themselves from false teachers and religions. I've had a couple of heated discussions, not heated on my part because I knew where I was speaking from, but heated on the other person's part about people he knew love Jesus, but they're still in a false religion. They're still in a cult, but they love Jesus. They embrace the truth of the word. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense to me. What fellowship does light have with dark? That's biblical. How would the Holy Spirit who lives in this person who's supposed to be a believer allow this person to sit and listen to blasphemies against the Lord Jesus Christ? The Holy Spirit would just grab that person by the heart if they were really a believer, twist it, and no, you're getting out of here, and you're getting out of here now. And so I challenged this person I had this conversation with. I challenged them, show me in Scripture where that is actually a good thing, where that's even permitted, where that's something to be sought after. Oh, well... And then he changed his tune. Oh, well, they're kind of, it's an evangelistic outreach. It's a mission field now. Like, okay, let me think for a minute and let me say I agree with you. Fine. This person who is a believer, claims to be a believer, right? But is in this false religion, is now stirring things up in the midst of this false religion, sowing discord amongst those who don't believe what he believes or she believes. That doesn't seem proper. But even if it is proper, I'll go even further. How is this person getting fellowship? How is this person fellowshipping? Oh, well, they're fellowshipping with the people in that church. Like, eh, stop. Again, what fellowship does light have with dark? You can only have fellowship with other believers. A true believer can only have fellowship with another believer. You cannot have fellowship with someone who's an atheist. That's, again, back them into a truth corner, and that's when he blew up. So that's what happens. But that's it. Flee from the stranger. We can't be of the flock of the Lord and be in community, what would otherwise be fellowship if it was believers, in community with unbelievers and false teachers. It doesn't work that way. Number five, last one, move in and out and find pasture. Freedom. True sheep of the flock of God moves in and out and finds pasture, knowing that the Lord protects, provides, and grants permission. Believers mingle with the world. We go out into the world amongst unbelievers. We're in the world, but not of it. We get dirtied by the world, but not stained, as we saw in in James. So this idea of the fortress mentality, where we extract ourselves from the world and only do business with Christian businesses, and we only socialize with believers, and we only do this with Christians, and wherever possible, only interact with Christians. That's a big movement today, by the way. It's called the Benedict Option, if you ever run across that or know anyone. Be careful. There's that tendency. I certainly would love to do that. Who wants to be exposed to nonsense? But that's not what we're called to do. Again, it's the Lord's way. If we are the Lord's, we're bond servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we have been bought with a price, we don't have a say. We do what he tells us to do because our life is not our own. And our life is to go out and be lights to the world, sharing the love of Christ and the truth of Christ with those who need to hear it. And so that's what we're supposed to do, move in and out. We'll go out into the world, we'll work in secular places, and then we gather together periodically as believers. The flock comes together, we have fellowship, we rejoice with one another, we pray with one another, study the Word together, we're refilled, and then we go back out and do it all over again. But as the days get darker, we need to gather more frequently. (laughs) Once a week is not cutting it for me anymore. We need these multiple opportunities to come together for fellowship and socializing and all of that encouragement that comes from that. And just leave you with this last thought. We claim that we're of the flock of God, but would the world know that by our thoughts, words, and actions? Would the world know that we are our sheep of the flock of God by what we 
say and what we do. And I'm telling you, this is, I don't know about you, maybe I shouldn't generalize, maybe it's just me, but I feel like I'm being challenged by this more now than ever before in the social discourse on what's going on, whether it's political or social. It's like, got to represent Christ well amongst these so many who claim the name of Christ but are not acting very Christ-like. That's the challenge for us. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we know that we're in these last days and it's getting more and more difficult to uh, represent you well as opposition to the gospel, opposition to you is growing like never before. But Holy Spirit, you dwell in each and every one of us who are true born-again believers and you empower us and you guide us and you direct us. Please, please help us to be sensitive to your calling in our life, that the things to think, say, and do that reflect well on you, that are an accurate representation of you, Lord Jesus. We don't want to present our own idea of who Jesus is to the world, but the true idea of who Jesus is, the truth. So we want to do that well. We want to do it accurately so that you get the glory, Lord, and that many would respond. Even in these last days, many would respond to the call to repent that they would repent and they would be saved. Lord, uh, we love you, we thank you, and we commit our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen.